We're going to listen to Reinhard Gensel talk about the amazing story behind the study of the compact object in the galactic center, a 40-year journey. Reinhard Gensel earned his, P earned his PhD in physics and astronomy from the University of Bonn in 1978. He held a postdoctoral position at the Harvard Smithsonian Center of Astrophysics, followed by a Miller Fellowship at the University of California in Berkeley, where he became full professor in 1985. In 1986, he was appointed director of the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics in Garching. Reinhard Gensel has been spearheading the high spatial resolution imaging and spectroscopy studies of the motions of stars surrounding the Sagittarius A radio source in the Milky Way Center using the European Southern Observatory facilities in Chile. As we are about to hear a fascinating and still evolving story. Professor Gensel, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, it's a great honor and uh, a pleasure to be here and speak to you about the research we have done in trying to establish that in the center of our nearest galaxy, the Milky Way, is an object which uh, is a, a massive black hole of four million solar masses beyond any reasonable doubt. I've called this the 40-year journey. It's been a long time. Many people were involved. Experimental work has been ongoing for these decades to improve the sensitivity, the accuracy of positional measurements, and the precision of data to come where we are now and then where we can say with some certainty uh, what I will tell you. Many people have been involved in my own group, people before me, uh, mentors, but also many students and postdocs. I'm very, very glad to have been able to work with such a great crowd of people. And I also would like to uh, emphasize uh, the great work of our uh, team in California who have been competing with us. Uh, but in the end, of course, we have come up with the same uh, basic result, which only strengthens the overall believability of the result. Now, over these uh, decades, of course, there were several phases. So I'll give you this talk in five phases. First, the motivation, and then four phases within the program uh, which I participated in. Now, let's look at the backdrop. Of course, we know that the theory uh, of general relativity is 100 years old and the mathematical refinements went on for a number of decades, ending in the 60s with the so-called Kerr space-time metric and the word of Penrose on the ergosphere and others. Roger Penrose being the one who is being honored uh, with the prize this year as well. So this theoretical foundation uh, gave us the idea, the perspective, that there are objects which one would call black holes uh, which basically uh, you know, dis are, are not communicating from the insides with the outside, but have tremendous, can have tremendous impact on the gravitational field, the space-time surrounding it, and therefore influence the environment. Now, this was all theory until the 60s when several things happened. X-ray astronomers started observing very intensely X-ray emitting binary stars, uh, some of which we now believe are stellar uh, black holes. And, and that's the most important thing for this talk, the quasars were discovered. Initially by radio astronomers, and then optical astronomers discovered that these objects in optical images look like stars, yet in their spectra, there's evidence that uh, spectral lines, which are in the laboratory very well known, are shifted by such an amount as to make these objects very distant, many hundreds of millions of light years away, such that what looks like a, a fairly uh, uh, you know, faint star really must be a, a trem tremendously luminous object. This one, the first one, uh, 
as a thousand times the luminosity of our entire Milky Way, all coming from the central light here or so. Theorists thinking about this then uh, found out that it was basically impossible to explain the radiation uh, produced in these quasars by normal fusion, like in stars. But, and that's the surprising thing, when material falls into, spirals into a massive black hole, before the material disappears in the event horizon and therefore is, uh, you know, escapes from our line of, uh, from, from our view, uh, it can release enormous uh, amount of energy uh, due to the gra gravitational energy lost. And, and that can be up to 40% uh, mc squared. So, surprisingly, paradoxically, therefore, uh, the model of massive black hole uh, paradigms for the explanation of, of quasars was uh, invented. Uh, but of course, how would you prove that? Prove that in the sense that you cannot only observe phenomena like high energy radiation or these uh, spectacular radio jets of relativistic plasma emanating from many of the quasars. This is indirect evidence for a very energetic object, but not proof in the sense of actually showing that there's a gravitational potential as compact as you would have to have for a massive black hole. So how would you prove that? In a very famous paper in 1971, Lyndon Bell and Rees then uh, proposed that uh, whilst it's impossible to measure uh, you know, uh, effects of gravity in distant quasars, if all galaxies would have central massive black holes, just most of them not very active in terms of accretion, well then you could use nearby galaxies, in particular also the center of our Milky Way. So that's how our Milky Way center became center stage and evolved from there to, to a laboratory. So let's take a trip from the outer parts of the Milky Way into our uh, disk galaxy towards the center. Now you see immediately in optical light there are these dark patches. That means uh, that there's a lot of dust between the stars, which actually prevents us from seeing into the center of the Milky Way. So to see there, we have to switch to longer wavelengths, infrared, radio, or shorter wavelength, x-rays. This is an infrared image, which we can now make with modern telescopes, which shows us the innermost region of our Milky Way being a very dense star cluster. This is shown here in the blue uh, region. And in the center of this uh, star cluster, as you will see in a second, uh, radio astronomers found very intense radio emission, in particular, a very compact radio source. Surrounding that uh, radio emission, in green here, is a gas, a very dense neutral gas, as well as ionized gas, the so-called mini spiral in ionized gas. And in fact, that was the first path towards looking whether there is a central mass. Basically, what one does is to look whether this gas is orbiting and it, uh, look from the velocities what the mass would be. So indeed, a group around Charles Sounds at the University of California with his students uh, started looking at this ionized gas streamers here. And you here see how the velocities change along this streamer here, and the numbers here give you the mass which would be required if this would be uh, a, f a free falling, if you like, parabolic or elliptical orbit, uh, and the numbers are two, three, four, five millions of solar masses. So that was the first evidence that there was a lot of mass there, more mass than the stars would allow. Then the next stage was the radio source. Many years have uh, been uh, used to uh, refine the measurement on the radio source. On this diagram where you have wavelength versus the size of the source, you can see the shorter wavelength you go to, the smaller the source becomes. And spectacularly, when you go to the millimeter waves, here's one millimeter. The size of the source is 10 micro arc seconds. To give you a feeling, that's about the size of a euro 
coin on the moon. That's how compact the radio emission is. And in fact, that would be the event horizon size of a four million solar mass black hole. So the combination of this mass being large and this size being small was the first evidence in the 1980s that there might be something uh, in the center of our Milky Way. So here on the left side, uh, one could um, take the various measurements here and see that this mass was between one and four million solar masses. Not very accurately initially, uh, maybe 50% or so. On the, on the right side, you see as a function of distance from the center, the mass, and here you see that uh, within about a, a parsec or so, uh, there seems to be a constant mass. That's an indication for a concentrated central mass, but still at a very large number of event horizon radii, a million. But it was the first evidence. How to go from there? Well, you want to go further in, and you want to use indications which are more stable and more easy to interpret than gas, which can be pushed around by forces other than gravity. And these are stars. And so in the 90s, two groups, one in Europe using telescopes in Chile, and uh, one group uh, at, in California using the Keck telescope, starting using the new developed uh, infrared uh, uh, imaging detectors for the space telescope, uh, to build cameras which allowed very short exposures. The trick is that when you take a picture in the optical or in the infrared, uh, then of course the Earth atmosphere will blur the image such that you cannot make a very high precision measurement. To measure the motions of stars in the sky, you want to have very accurate positional measurements over time and see whether they change. So this was the first technique both groups used the speckle techniques, as you see here. You make short exposures and freeze the motions of the Earth's atmosphere, and then in post-processing, you basically stack, add the images to get uh, about a five times improvement in the angular uh, sharpness of the images over what you can do with normal uh, detection. The second technique which had to be developed is to get spectra, because the motions on the sky give you two motions, two, and the Doppler motions along the line of sight, which is the third, uh, you can get through the spectra from lines in, in, the stellar, in the stellar spectra. For that, we developed uh, what is now called the integral field unit. Basically, a normal spectrometer just disperses the light in one direction and doesn't allow you to image. But by using an image slicer, you can basically generate a huge long slit which decodes the two dimensions, and then you bring this through a spectrograph, which disperses the light. And then in the end, in the computer, you can put, put that back together. So using these techniques, a few years later, we had sharp images of the central uh, light years, and we could look for changes on the sky of their positions. Here's an example. The green cross is the position of Sagittarius A star, that radio source, which is so compact. This is one light month, uh, this circle. And you can see from time to time to time, from one year to the next, in three different colors, uh, the position of this star, very near Sag A star, clearly changes. If you look up, then that's a motion of in excess of 1,000 kilometers per second, something which you see not in the solar system. So these stars are whizzing around at a speed of more than 100 times the Earth around the sun. So that's already a qualitative indication of a strong mass. And is it a point mass? Well, OK, Kepler's laws tell you that if you have a central mass and objects are moving around it, and the further away you are, the slower. And indeed, when you look here, the innermost stars move obviously very fast, while the other ones here you know, do not show this prism effect. So that's Kepler's laws in color, so to speak. And indeed, when you make this more quantitatively, you can derive then the mean speed of the stars as a function of distance 
from the radio source. That's what this is. And this tail here is indeed the first quantitative indication that indeed there is a four million solar mass or three million solar mass object in the center and further out when this flattens. That is the, the, the effect of the star cluster surrounding it. So that was the second phase. That was until 98 with stellar motions making more precise estimates of the stellar mass. Now you see we are you know, at the level of about a uh, little, little over 10% and a factor of uh, five or so inwards. So it's both a more precise measurement of the mass as well as concentrating that mass on a smaller region. So by that time, it was already fairly difficult to construct reasonable alternatives. So the path was, uh, this could be a black hole, but now we have to exclude alternative options of other configurations uh, by going closer and closer and measuring more and more precisely. Well, how could you go from this phase onward? Well, here we are measuring the, basically the average of the motions. Now we would like to see actually orbital motion, direct orbital motion of individual stars. That's much more precise. But mostly in astronomy, these kinds of motions can only be detected over many hundreds of years. That's when nature came in and helped us and gave us some stars which were not supposed to be there, namely very, very close on solar system scales. And those indeed, uh, move fast enough that we can see motions. So by the early 2000s, both groups uh, were working on eight meter glass telescopes, the biggest telescopes we have now. And we had both equipped these telescopes with what is called adaptive optics. So instead of the speckle imaging, we are now correcting the wavefront before we detect it and make sharp imagery right away. That gives us a lot of sensitivity and high precision imaging. By 2000, Andrea's group saw the first deviations from straight, uh, straight motion accelerations. So that gave us already hope that maybe we could see these accelerations for a number of stars. In particular, this one here had one of the possible solutions. You see there are three possible solutions, which was an orbit of only about 20 years or so. And indeed, two years later, both groups saw that this star, whose orbit you now see, highly elliptical orbit, approached the galactic center to about 17 light hours, <coughs> moved there at about 7,600 kilometers per second, tremendously fast, and on a distance scale of about three times the Neptune's orbital uh, radius. So if you put this into Kepler's laws, that gives you again four million solar masses. The same four million solar masses we had before, but now concentrated on the scale of only 17 light hours. Now this is only one of the stars we followed, as you see in the movie down below. In fact, uh, we have partial orbits uh, for about 30, 40 stars, yet this is the best one. So at the end of this stage, uh, which is uh, you know, a few years ago, we had ever more precise measurements of the mass, and what's more important, because of this close approach, we could exclude that the mass is any more extended than about 100 times the event horizon size. So by now, by that stage, the exclusion principle was very powerful. You could exclude all kinds of hypothetical uh, situations, including what one would call dark astrophysical clusters, like, for instance, a con conglomerate of neutron stars, a million neutron stars, or, or, or stellar black holes, or something like this. So there's very, very little lift, it's a million, four million solar mass black hole, and perhaps this thing here a so-called boson star. So here we are. We have already very good evidence. Do we stop? Are we finished? No, we are not. A, now we are, we are looking at this as a laboratory. Not anymore to say, is there a compact mass? We are certain of that now. 
But now we want to know, A, is it really a black hole in the sense of general relativity? And is general relativity the proper theory <coughs> also in these extreme environments which have not been tested? For that, we have to still make better measurements. So by 2004, uh, we talked to ESO, the European Southern Observatory, and proposed to build a new instrument. A new instrument which would allow us to combine the light of all four eight-meter telescopes into a so-called interferometric uh, telescope, very well known from radio techniques, of over 100 meter diameter. So a 100 over eight meters is a factor greater than 10. So actually it's you know, more than an order of magnitude improvement in, in, in resolution. So we built this instrument we call gravity, which brings the light together from all the four meter telescopes. It's underneath here. Uh, you have to make all kinds of corrections, etc., which are all in tunnels underneath this device and has been uh, built by, by the European Southern Observatory while we built this new instrument which had three milli arc second resolution and a, a astrometric precision uh, coming close to the event horizon scale. The star in the meantime was doing its orbital period and was coming back and we were ready so that uh, in 2000, 18, when the next peri occurred, we could use the interferometer now to use this high precision tool to really look very, very closely. By the way, you can see that here you see the star with in the, in the very close to peri, and you see the black hole itself. I'll come back to this later. So the experiment, in fact, is uh, now actually conceptually very simple. You measure directly on the sky the separation between what you think is the center of mass and the object. Here, near Perry, we could see the motion uh, every day. Previously, we had to wait for a month or two. And we had a very precise uh, definition of the orbital parameters of this ellipse and thereby uh, a high position on the mass. And now we can begin to look for effects of general relativity. And in fact, the first one is the fact that when light from the star comes to us, when it's very close to the massive uh, black hole, it has to climb out of this uh, potential well, which is uh, basically you, leads to a red shift, to a loss of energy. And here, relative to, to a Newton orbit, is in fact this red shift which we have measured in comparison to what you would predict from general relativity, which is the blue scale. So that was already the first uh, triumph and the first evidence that indeed GR holds, very important. This was, uh, uh, you know, uh, confirmed by uh, the UCLA group one year later and the first step. The next one, is to actually show that the equivalence principle holds, in, particular, in this particular form, the positional invariance. And that we can do because in the spectra of the stars, we have different atoms. Here is helium, and uh, here is hydrogen, and here is helium. So we have different atomic clocks. And according to Einstein's theory, the results should not depend on anything but uh, 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 the, gra uh, the uh, gravitation shouldn't come in that there are different atomic clocks. And indeed, uh, the results we get from the different tracers agree to within a few percent. The next ex uh, um, effect expected is the fact that while in uh, Newton's theory, a planet uh, orbiting the sun on an orbit uh, would hold its position in the, in, in the plane if there's no other uh, no other object nearby. Uh, but in uh, general relativity, that's not the case. There uh, is a precession of the orbit, which depends on the, uh, the distance the star comes to the object and the mass. And so for the star S2, relative to a, a Newton orbit, uh, and setting the, an angle equals to zero up here at Apo, uh, near Perry, uh, this precession is, is, is maximum. You see basically 
in, in x coordinate here is a kink. Or in angle, it's, it's, it's a change by about 11, 12 arc minutes per orbital period. So that's the prediction. And that's what we saw with gravity. OK, here are the different uh, measurements in x. So you see clearly this kink. And here you can see uh, the uh, change in, in, in angle. And indeed, exactly as predicted by uh, general relativity. So that's, that's very, very important, because it shows us that indeed GR holds also in these extreme environments, which have not yet, uh, had not yet been, been tested. Now, how, how close can we come to the center? Would it be possible to actually probe the region right around the event horizon? Well, actually, in the early 2000s, uh, the X-ray astronomers and then we discovered uh, variability, uh, variable emission in the infrared and the X-rays from the black hole itself, continuously variable emission. And uh, the theorists, in particular Broderick and Loeb, had proposed that what you see here are uh, accelerated, uh, energized electrons, uh, which basically are formed in this hot plasma right around the black hole as the gas is orbiting, thereby forming hot spots for uh, you know, a few tens of minutes. If so, you, should, you might be able to see the motions of these hot spots. So indeed, in 2018, on three occasions, the black hole got brighter than its normal state by about a factor of 100 or so. And we could see, uh, indeed, these motions uh, on the scale of uh, you know, about five times the event horizon size, or six to 10 times the gravitational radius. With orbital periods of 40 to 50 minutes uh, inferred from this, this means the velocities are speed of light, which is exactly what you would expect if these hotspots would move uh, uh, in, in Keplerian motion, if you like. Another thing here is that this, this emission is polarized. So that tells you um, that magnetic fields are present. And from the uh, properties of the change of the direction of the magnetic field with time, which we can infer from these data, we, f we find that the B fields is likely poloidal, so along the axis of the black hole and not in the orbital axis of the motion. That's surprising and probably indicates that the galactic center has a very, very strong magnetic field. This will be very important for the future to, to, f to, to, to research further in order to understand this strange uh, but highly exciting environment around the black hole. So here we are, after phase four, Parry has happened. Now, as you see with gravity in particular, our accuracy of measuring the mass is better than 1%. In fact, the statistical uncertainty is 0.3%. So that's a precision measurement, something which you can do not very often in, in astronomy. And we can penetrate now basically from the sphere of influence where we showed the first measurements in phase one all the way inwards by six orders of magnitude close to the event horizon size. Are we done? Well, it's very likely that this object we are looking at indeed is a black hole. We don't know its spin yet. And we would have to know that in order to begin to understand whether the Kerr matrix holds. And then we would have to test whether the quadrupole moment of this object fulfills what we call the Noahair theorem. If we know that, then we would in fact have the final result that GR is indeed correct at the scale of the event horizon, which is the closest we can come. That we do not have yet, but that's where we want to go. So after these 40 years, I would say, the Galactic Center has been extremely helpful to astronomy and to physics. Uh, two groups have used this to push ever further. And uh, many questions remain or go beyond what we have now. But uh, we now have evidence, indeed, that these objects, which were theoretically discussed by Roger Penrose and others, actually are realized in nature. 
Thank you very much.